That is After Dark, and we're back uh, back on StreamYard, uh, our recording for Sirius 142XM Radio, the high pride of the Howard University Network. Uh, Lion Brother KD, Frat Brother Eric, Orson the Morganite, Tiff about to be thrown off the show. Uh, we're about to try something different. I'm going to drop the link to this StreamYard on our social medias, and let's see what we come up with through the course of this show. Uh, so, brothers and sisters, hopefully um, we won't get the, the best of the ratchets. Or maybe we might. Maybe we might. I was wondering if you wanted us to respond to that because <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's hey man. Are How we? Are we radio welcomes us. Are we yeah. ourselves not the best of the ranches? We might on, be. on, on, on the right day. Hold on, that's um, the right one to take. So be ready for the questions. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and get into it. Um, big uh, week as of today uh, for the HBCU community. There's going to be a Zoom meeting between White House officials uh, led by. Senior Advisor, Morehouse Alumnus, Cedric Richmond, uh, with the HBCU presidents this week. Now, there's not an official agenda on what they're going to talk about. It is believed to be the first formal conversation between the leaders of the sector and the, the White House officials. And there's no word on if President Joe Biden will participate or Vice President Kamala Harris will participate. We only know so far it's Cedric Richmond and whoever he des- he designates as his proxy. I would ask you guys, what do you think the number one topics of discussion should be for this, what is believed to be the the initial meeting between the HBCU community and the Biden administration? Eric, you looking dubious, bro. All right. So, like, I'm just going to listen. Our schools need people to be able to make donations. You know, the easiest way for people to be able to make donations if they don't have to pay their student loans. Mm-hmm. My thought process is, so what happened to this whole student loan plan? Because this whole, oh, we're just going to pre- freeze payments until September situation. Yeah, it's real cute, but it doesn't just help us. It helps a whole bunch of people. Correct. So my thought process is, is like, you know, first, like that's the first thing that pops into my mind. The second thing that pops into my mind is, I don't know what like the common agenda across the board is. I mean, we ca- we often see that, you know, organizations such as UNCF because they deal mostly they deal with private institutions, and you have T- Thurgood Marshall that deals with public institutions, and there's the schools have different situations um, as far as what needs they have on, on a general right. basis. But I think ultimately speaking, my biggest question is. Prior to this meeting, did all the representatives of these schools decide to get together and have common conversations like, what is our collective agenda? What do we need? Can we work? So can we come in as a united front and say, these are the things that we need, not the things that I need as a president of this institution? That's just my general uh, general question. I hope it happened, but I would have hoped it happened prior years, too. So. It, well, before I say anything, what Tiff, what do you think? You it, you look like you're in agreement that there should be consensus before the conversation. And to be fair, before you start, I, I got word of it through a UNCF communication. So the appearance is that at least UNCF, and I'm assuming TNCF and Nafio are sending out communications to say, you know, be ready for this call. And there may not be a collective agenda. It may just be like, hey, you know, I'm Joe Biden. Nice to meet you again. And I look forward to speaking with you. But if there are opportunities for them to talk, what do you what do you think are are focus areas, particularly if you if you cannot have an opportunity for consensus? So for the last what? Let's just say eight years. Mm, yeah, let's just start with with eight. We have or you have digest has um, compared the Obama administration and what they did, um, the negatively impacted HBCUs versus what what it is that we gained from the Trump administration. And if I was a president or somebody that um, a president listened to, I would be, you know, getting my, you know, Venn diagram T graph together to say this is what happened between these two administrations. Where where can we put ourselves, push ourselves forward to where 
we are in a better place now that we're we're dealing with somebody who's familiar because this person has been um in in an in a presidential administration before you're not you're not new to this you've been uh, uh, an elected official for a long time you know the needs that we have and you ran on a platform that um that expressed all these things about knowing what our community needs what does that look like in real life so if i was a president or somebody that listened to um that that a president listened to i would be saying hey we need to compare contrast and come up with a collective plan if you will like i think that what we saw throughout the trump administration i think people came together and was like, and were like really upfront and in people's faces about it because it was Trump. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to watch from from here and watch people do nothing or do less because this is a friendlier face right. or friendlier administration. I don't want to watch that. Right. I don't. Or do you think we should take a QAnon approach? Uh, to the to the White House and, and galvanize and say, you know what, not storm the Capitol, but at least have a grassroots a grassroots thing where it's not just presidents that pressure is being applied, not just from an administrative standpoint, but there are alumni and students also active on social media saying the storm is coming. <laughs> um. Um, considering that you know the last administration forgave some loans from the storm, that wouldn't be a bad uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be mm -hmm. a bad hashtag to have. But I think this is an indictment, or the first of many indictments on Kamala Harris, even if it's not her policy. Wow, you went straight to, straight to the vice president no. already. <laughs> just, well, 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 just because again, you can't be you can't announce your campaign for president Howard. Um, you can't have your most viral video be you marching with the marching band. You can't have all these that are kin you to historically black colleges, you and Raphael Warnock and, and so forth and so on. Um, <clears throat> there has to be, at least in my opinion, a concerted effort by her to make her place known in this. Um, as we all know, people say like the most inconsequential position in government is vice president because they don't have a ton of power um, and they really get delegated to run different committees, things of that nature, um, but they don't necessarily have um, the power to really lead from a, a policy perspective. To me, she has to to say to, to Joe Biden, like, let me run this and then champion the things that happen from this. I think that'll be a good first step for her. But if she doesn't and she takes a more passive approach, um, as Obama did, it won't it won't help. And I think that it only will lead to more disdain towards her because in many cases what we see is that we get more from people who we view as our enemies than those who are allies and she's the biggest ally in the history of american politics so she has a very 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 big platform she has big shoes to fit. i mean I think she's on pedestal. it's almost unreachable but her goal has to be to reach that like there's, i don't think there's any way that she'll be able to do all the things that she probably that we probably want her to do as a you know alumna of a, a historically black college, but she better try because if she doesn't, um, we any sympathy for her because we already have a president set from what Obama didn't do. We have a president set from what, from what Trump did, and quite frankly, Seth Griffin to me looks like Omarosa right now. Because again, oh God! <laughs> no, again, they're sending us. They're sending us. The more rough around the edges, more local. You know, take a rich local from New Orleans. The local in the mix, you know, get busy type. I'm sure some bouncing money gonna be bouncing. So they sending us, they sending us take a rich. We need, we gonna need a bit more. Is all I'm saying. I'm gonna stop so I get in trouble. I'm turning red. Katie, there's a lot to unpack. What Orange just said. Notably, I do think that that there's something to be said about, um, should should vice president harris be the face of it she almost and i think that he has a point she almost has to be because they've talked it up that much mm -hmm. so it would be it would be unusual 
if the president or the the secretary of education was kind of leading the HBCU march and it wasn't her, right? It would almost seem disingenuous. Is, is that real? I think it's a fair critique, but I also want to want everybody to understand because this has been coming up a lot if you pay attention to just coverage in the national media. It hasn't been a week. Yet. Has it been a week? It's been a week. Nope. Well, it's, it's, if it has been, it's been exactly problems. that, right? Right. You can't solve all of the world's problems in a week. And so for me, I just I appreciate that they're taking a measured approach to how they resolve issues in the community in general. Like he signed a ton of executive orders a day, one of which was it even a day yesterday, one of which was to address racial um, equity. Mm -hmm. right? And so just just hearing the president say out loud, yo, we need to address white supremacy. Not, not necessarily is it enough. That's great. A lot of presidents just would not be bold enough to get, use their platform to say, yo, we have a problem with white America and we need to address it, right? So he's moving in the right direction and I do appreciate the language he's using. I want this to come from Congress. I don't want to just bully this through because if we learned anything about American history, um, if Obama was a pinnacle for people of color in the black community, Trump was the white lash. And so what we're also trying to avoid is more white lash from from progress, right? So, Vice President Eric. Right. Which, right. And this was why I'm kind, I'm kind of glad she's not sitting in that seat in hindsight because you see that they tried to repeat one of these jack. One of these congresswomen tried to impeach impeach him on the first day. Like, right, right here. imagine if they this 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 gruntle with a white man, right? Some of the heat she would be facing as the president. So, for me, I just want them to hold themselves accountable for what they've said, especially because he uplifted HBCUs today. I mean, big flex. You think Kamala Harris is ready coming from HBCU? That was his words. Right. And after, he, after he won, he's been doing that. Like you keep throwing these signals out. Yeah, so let's talk about the policy. Let's talk about loan forgiveness, as you said. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you're going to shield HBCUs from free community college and what that can do to our enrollment. Mm -hmm. How are you going to talk about Pell Grant eligibility and increases in the amount? Yeah. How are you going to address things like, um, uh, you know, borrower defense when people come out and say, you know, I got a degree, but I can't find a job. You owe me money back. Right. You know, that's not that. There's and, a lot of stuff we got to do. Right. And, and, for, and for me, I just want us to be included in the next set of innovation right he's talking a lot about green energy and renewables and i just want hbcus to have direct involvement in that if i had to make one request involve our stem programs right just make sure that we got a seat at tesla's table at g at general electric's table at bell's table like everybody that has a seat at the big table in energy companies make sure we got a seat too that's, that's, that's the best that's the, that's the best thing he could do for us right now and to your point katie because it's an excellent one I don't think it's humanly possible. I don't think it's mathematically possible to catch HBCUs up to where white, predominantly white institutions are. No you know, shit. Billions of dollars that were probably lost to, to, to undo generations of disparity. Right. I don't think anybody's going to spend that money. So what does success actually look like? What does equity look like if it's, if it's almost impossible at catch HBCUs? Hmm. That don't mean that you don't try. I wasn't saying don't try. I'm saying what does it look like? Because we're it'll never be equitable. It's been too long. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, of it, we'll go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's it's a combination of the money, but also um, the money as in this. This is money. Money being given, but also um, federal federal uh, contracts, making sure that nobody is stealing from people. Because the money has to keep coming in. I, I, I'm not going to just say that we'll never catch up. We can catch up if we, A, get what's owed, B, get these federal contracts uh, and partnerships on the dotted line and go from there. Like, it, it, can, it can be done. It can be done, but that's only if we have equitable policies that are, that are enforced in place um and not just people writing reports about saying what they've done but right. like that being it and, and i think we want the federal government to solve issues that really are state issues and and it, it's more important for us is to make the state what did i read about penalizing the states today what did i read because the federal government <laughs> can only do so much 
Yeah. Right? But they can but, but some government can influence. Sure, but they can sure, influence. They have, they have the biggest well, bully. They have the biggest bully bullshit. Thirty-eight bullshit. states ignored it. Right. While we're having this discussion, I think it is important to also include that when we're talking about fixing the sector of higher education, that is HBCUs, unfortunately, a lot of the presidents of these institutions don't have the answers. A lot of them are unwilling to change and progress things moving forward to actually move the sector, like move the sector ahead. Right. So. You know, so what I'm saying is, is that even when we're talking about things like, yes, we want, we want, you know, we want leadership from the top, right? We want Kamala to actually impact us at all, too, right? But all, all I'm saying is, is that sometimes you might need to go get some of these consultants who work in higher education that graduated from HBCUs that work in this field. Sometimes you might have to go to some of these companies that do work in higher ed policy that could see, oh, these are the, really the things that need to take place to make these things progress forward. Mm -hmm. Some of the answers you're not going to get are some of the answers you really need to get to really for us to really see the progress that we want are not going to come from the people who unfortunately and historically speaking don't last in positions beyond five years you are inside of positions in allowing things that have always been to continue forward and people who take credit for the advances that were really put forth by the person that preceded them in that role as if it was something that they they brought they brought up themselves. So if we're if we're going to speak about you know progress for the sector as a whole, we have to recognize that just because somebody has a title doesn't mean that they necessarily have the expertise to really push things forward in a way that we need our schools to be moved forward. This is a fascinating conversation, and just like on Friday, they will probably launch a series of discussions between the two sides. That's something we're going to have to keep monitoring um, because I don't think. For as much emphasis and attention people will pay to Biden's work in education and as much as they will pay to HBCUs, I don't think that people are conscious of, OK, policy for HBCUs. We look at cosmetic stuff. Is he going to go do a commencement speech? Is he hiring HBCU graduates? Mm -hmm. um, are you, you know, are you um, mentioning you know, HBCU excellence in your speeches and stuff, we'll, we'll be satisfied with that. And that, that won't even come close to the policy work that we need. So we got to keep watching it. Um, the next topic I want to get into now, this is, um, I don't know if this is deserving of overtime, but we talk a lot about executive leadership at HBCUs. And, and just before we got on air, we were talking about um, our dear brother Kwame Kilpatrick and should, should he lose his letters because of crimes committed? <laughs> um, St. Augustine's University, uh, private private HBCU in 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 uh, in Raleigh uh, had a trustee suspended uh, from his position on the board of bishops with the AME Zion Church, uh, Staccato Powell. Um, now the allegations against him are you know mal financial malfeasance, uh, trying to force uh, churches under his pre uh, prelate or prelate. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's um, some prelate either way. Either way, so churches under his jurisdiction to amend. Uh, deeds to their churches to help satisfy some issues with bankruptcy, which the, Sorry, the, the region went bankrupt. Um, and the Board of Bishops suspended him over the summer. <laughs> it's just now coming to light now. Should that matter in terms of his his leadership or his presence or his membership as an HBCU trustee? Tiffany, this is an extension of your church. Um, okay. Are you going, are you going to rant like you did on Morris Brown or are you going to defend the church? I'm pretty sure that Absalom, Absalom Jones, uh, was it Absalom Jones? I'm pretty sure Absalom would object to that characterization. Thank you very much. That's one. <laughs> Two, I would say, as I said to you privately, if he did it once, he'll do it again. It's a pattern. And if he did that <laughs> in his district and The church didn't say nothing to the institution that is what under the church. They weren't talking. You deserve. <laughs> you deserve. Fred Brother Aaron looks worried about the conversation. Do, in other words, it's a it's a legitimate. It's a pattern. It's all connected. This, this is this is not a rant. 
But this is something where he had the ability to do the thing and it happened more than once under his watch. I don't know. I, and I hear no, what you're saying. I know. I know. No, but you don't know that in every case. For example, we got a lot of HBCU staff members, faculty members, administrators who like to get drunk. That doesn't mean that they're hold in up. the president's hold office up. drunk. Hold that up. doesn't mean that hold they're up. in meetings drunk. I mean, <laughs> hold, up. hold up. What somebody does with their own body is their business. But when you have other people's money that you are responsible for, in other words, you can't I, stand or make decisions. As if it's your own finances. Okay? But I don't, I don't, I don't know. There's an open question. I understand the discussion, but there's a question of if what you, know you do, are. what you do as a professional may not no. impact or should not impact your no. role as a volunteer on a on a board. You not know? for this, not for this, because he's in that position because he is a bishop. But so, he, no. but, but it's no. not a it's not a mandatory seat at the board. But he, he knows the rules. I, I understand. Katie, you were getting ready to win. And so I don't, I don't have too much to add because I'm a Methodist. So, I, you know, we don't, I haven't dealt with this. Okay, Eric laughed at that. In <laughs> year. <laughs> what? 30 that? years in the Methodist church. I've never dealt with someone staying in the church. Uh, Christ United Methodist on Washington and, Tr and Chase. All of them are Christ United Methodist. So if you're not from Baltimore, you don't know what Washington You shout out the church and PlayStation. Um, Nice plug they from Katie. <laughs> Um, but it, it just but understanding like just the feeling of someone in your organization stealing from you, right? I you know, I understand why there's some pause with him being on the board because now you have to scrutinize all of his activity. And I think as long as they're doing that with fidelity, even though they know he hasn't been operating with fidelity across the board, that's fair. Beyond that, you know, it, you reap what you sow. <laughs> You're supposed to be a man of faith. Why are you stealing from the people? You know, and why and they're not just stealing from the people you manipulating the system so you can even steal more. By the way, he's also on the board at Livingston. That's so he's on he's on two HBC boards. That's insane. But you, you can't <laughs> say that if he's he's a CEO of a private company or a corporation, a public corporation, and he was placed on those boards. He's in that position because he is a bishop of that church. Not necessarily St. Augs. I understand Livingston, but not St. Augs. Because that's not that's not Amy Zion Church. That's yeah, Episcopal. But, you understand what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that's, he's, still, he's, still, he's still in these positions because yeah, of who he is. We, we talk, I, but you, we but, but, but in terms of corporate governance, but in terms of corporate governance, like, they're, they're people, the person who manages your 401k plan at, at your in, individual employer got a drinking problem. There's someone on that board who had issues. So I, I think that's the first thing. Second thing is that being a bishop in a church is an executive position. Like he is not okay. okay he's an executive. He's he's. But so so. What I'm saying is that he's held to the. In my opinion, he's held to the same standard as the CEO Apollo, who's getting ready to, to resign because of his connection to Jeffrey Epstein. So, and 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 he's not leaving the board. He's on the board of of, of, of Apollo. So he just lose. He just losing. He's just resigning from his position. So I think he should be able to stay on the board. Um, because again, it should be that the board members are checking each other. It should be some checks and balances. I think the, the bigger problem with HBCU boards in general is that we have far, far too much of an influence from the, the black church on our boards. And in my in my experience, it's those church leaders who cause most of the issues. It's not the people from the corporate world. But that's just me. I was on fire tonight, Brett. Would you? What were you gonna say? I have, I have, a, I have a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. First of all, y'all are hilarious. Um, <laughs> I, I, I typically, when it comes to to leadership for institutions, I like to um, use the Mary and Barry rule. <laughs> <laughs> and and by the Mary and Barry rule, I, I specifically mean. I do not care what they do from 5 p.m. till 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. I care everything that they do between 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. May of a life. Right? Right? Mayor for life. I care. What do you care? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> home. As long as it ain't impact the school, as long as it ain't impact the city, impact the city he was all right with me. All right. But that being said, I believe this is the third consecutive year since we've had Digest Up the Dark that I've had to ask this question. 
which is to say when it comes to the trustees of not just HBCUs, but in higher education across the board, who do they answer to? The model is messed up because you get to a certain point where it's like, all right, they make a decision on who's a uh, like, what does the leadership structure look like? We, people appoint people, members of board members, and to Tiffany's point, right? He got that position by and large due to the position that he held. If you can't maintain the position that you hold, mm. should you get the, could you keep the position that you got put right? in? You shouldn't be nowhere doing the volunteering work. Just like if there's somebody somewhere who happens to be taking liberties with the people of the organization that they've been working with and saying improper things around them and whatnot, then they may not need to be you know, on the board of multiple HBCUs, even though they've done a whole bunch of work regarding funding HB. Oh, my bad. She hasn't did anything to fund HBCUs. She just got a whole bunch of money for it. I'm not inserting any names, but y'all know who I'm talking about. But that's that's not the point. The point is we need to, like, this, the, the whole structure as it is is a problem. And a part of that is that us as, as alumni, as stakeholders, as those who care about the HBCU community, we have to have have to wield more of our influence in certain things because to me it extends even down to and it's not even a color thing if there it's just hypothetical if there's a board of trustees member who has an active part in a voting precinct being removed from your HBCU campus which allows in gerrymandering which which allows gerrymandering to take place Mm-hmm. That person needs to get removed from being a board of trustee because then you're actively working against one of the kind of tenants that tr- that HBCUs are kind of founded upon. You know, so it, my question is, he did something messed up. It should matter to the school, but at the end of the day, because of the messed up power structure, who gets him out of there? But see, the issue is, and I hear what y'all are saying, I really do. Um, but I think that we one thing that HBCUs have to be careful about is slippery slopes. So, for example, he's accused at this point. He hasn't been accused of stealing. He's been accused of trying to force people to, you know, sign your deed over so we can use this as collateral to get out of bankruptcy. He ain't in jail. He's facing a trial within the church, but not a trial within the civic system or the municipal municipal or federal court. So that's one thing. The other thing is, if we are going to start defining people and their board membership or leadership by what you do in your personal and professional life, don't you think that there is a natural there's a natural shift in saying what's wrong today is staccato powell and he's mismanaging money with the church tomorrow it could be a trustee who's in congress like morgan state's board chair quasi and fume who works with a trump supporter on a bill and then black folks say i don't like what you did get off the board you know what i mean or, or let's say if trump if trump was still in power and he's working with Trump on something or, or agreeing with Trump on something, get off the HBCU board because you're working with somebody we don't like. Like there's a, or you have a, or you have an issue, you have a messy divorce. You're, you're, you're not upholding the care because you're, because of infidelity, get off the board because you can't be faithful. You know what I mean? There, there's a, there's a slippery slope in some of these things. Like once you say one thing is wrong, at some point there's going to be other wrong that other people can define. And, and what do you do then? I just yeah, want to say, purity you know, test. Slippery, the slippery slopes have always been applied to people who are not men. So like you're saying all this, but there are women who who are told these very same things about simple, simple, simple occurrences in their private lives. So I don't have no sympathy for a man who has been in leadership for how how long he's been in leadership, who knows what his job description is, what it calls for, who decides to do something contrary or or tries to finesse it in a way. I don't have no sympathy. No, you know better. Just like Kwame, you know better. You know better. <laughs> and I also just believe that we, we you know take better. the fiduciary and not berating, um, you know, in the best and financial interest of your institution a lot more seriously than those other cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that is the thing that can cave you the quickest uh, is not managing your money correctly at the very least they should look they should actually do an investigation to anything that he's done pertaining to the right, school right that's, that's why the, the term is suspended right not fired not removed, right suspended. we just right. need to investigate to see if you should be on our board at the very board. least that should take that, place and that's fair we that is common practice in america now it, now to that point it is not unusual for boards to say you're a controversial figure we don't we want you off now i'm about to say, and then that was like, the other thing i was thinking about brandon right 
because mm-hmm. HBCUs left and right are getting all this bread from these um, ph- philanthropic efforts. You don't want to take yourself out there loop due to bad leadership. Mm-hmm. And so that could be the other reaction. And, and we're talking about St. Augustine, right? Mm-hmm. And they got some leadership issues, right? <laughs> they <didn't have> leadership <laughs> issues. And they've had some money issues before this came out. Right. They had money issues on the board, so that, so on the board you know before that. this happened. You know, it's so just you gonna like, throw him out for something that's happening outside of the school? Who to say he was not involved? He was. <laughs> that's exactly why we need you find out. <laughs> Let me say this: the the board members who were alleged to have been involved with their money issues are still on the board. So, mm. what standard have you set? Mm. Fair. Somebody got to be the example. Somebody got to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Fair. Listen, man, they're they're being corrupt trustees. From jump, fam, you <laughs> has dealt with corrupt has dealt with corrupt trustees for a long time, and you don't you rarely see people getting thrown off the board. So I'm not saying I'm not saying it's right. I'm not making a decision one way or another. I'm just saying how should the HBCU community consider when somebody gets in trouble outside of of operational stuff? That how much of an impact should it should it have on their board membership? Like if if you had a if you had an owner of a company and the company folded. Would you be able to say, like, throw this guy out? He might make the school fold. Is that fair? I'll say this. The conversation has to start with HBCU stakeholders need to start caring more about who encompassed the board of trustee members or the board of regent members that actually impact their institution because those are the ones that are selecting presidents or chancellors if you will those are the ones that are influencing the decisions of your university in ways that you don't even see you can't and i think to a degree like and there's a bunch of reasons as to why we don't right like we, we got real lives we got regular lives about our own personal lives to worry about but ultimately speaking if we start to care more about who gets in those positions then they already know Oh, let me let me be a little bit more careful with this because this title that I hold, people are watching me. Nine times out of ten, we really ain't watching nobody on that level. We ain't even having conversations as it pertains to who's up the, in those in those actual seats, influencing things going on. So, yes, we should care. Yes, we should we should we should raise alarm to it. But also, we got to be involved in the, at least considering what's going on and thinking about it. Long before something arises, I'm talking about people that are being selected. I, I think it has to start there. All right. And maybe these boys need to get a little bit younger, right? Maybe Say that, they- sir. <laughs> Say that, sir. Because <laughs> like one but person they, they see, down your organization. Man, they look they look like the Senate as far as average age. But, but <laughs> boys, yeah, but boys, these boys, boys never get old, never get younger because the whole point of them is to find someone who's seasoned and but the the, the, the bigger issue on these boards as people start to die off and people start to die off is that the traditional way the HBC boards were filled was again was majority clergy and then people who had businesses that interacted with the school's contractors. But as we start to see business get disrupted and the higher education model get disrupted, are we gonna be the ones inviting these tech people onto our boards? Are we going to be the ones who, who create these type of pipelines? Again, now we're, we're starting we're starting to see that a little bit because if you look at the the claflin zoom partnership for example one of the conditions of that partnership is claflin ceo i'm sorry zoom ceo has a seat on claflin's board so now and we're starting to see official. these big these big companies start to put some skin in the game right like okay we'll we'll we will work with you and we'll give you money and we'll create pipelines for workforce development but we got to be at the table seeing how you're creating these, how these these programs are being developed and how they're being enhanced and what are your trends on faculty retention and student performance and uh, university advancement and, all, and even athletics. What opportunities do we have to, to leverage athletics to benefit us? So it's but, starting to happen. But maybe the this- agile business model because they, one, they don't waste $10 million a year on football. Mm-hmm. Two, their entire alumni engagement model is on the things that the school gave to them, not a figurative and symbolic marching band homecoming experience. I'm not to, not to say that many of the school, but their business model is created on something that's real and tangible, not athletics, not social. This is what it is. Going so good. I'll, 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 say, I'll say this. Maybe the solution for our institution should be that 
board of trustee membership should have term lengths. Maybe okay, e maybe each board should be these board sheets should be for a particular person. Be or, saying or, for a while. Or, representative for technology, representative as it pertains to athletics, representative as it pertains to curriculum, represented as it pertains to donations and funding, mm -hmm. and, like workforce development, etc. You want to have these board members on there, and you get a whole bunch of people from business. All right, we need a more we need more balanced mm -hmm. boards, mm -hmm. and we need boards that the board tenures to have limits. Mm -hmm. Almost every almost every position when you talk about people who are given like volunteer positions, you if the president can only be the president for eight years, then why the heck have you been on the board for thirty? Like th somebody needs to get you out of there. Well, what I would say is if you look at it, it, look at the government model, y'all just brought it up. Look at Congress. What's the yeah, term no, limits? There? Term limits. Judges need everybody. Nobody everybody needs it, but who's going to pick everybody? Need time. And limits, here's right. another question: Got I would ask before we move on to that. Oris has a, a, a terrific point. It is difficult to get younger when the self uh the self promotion or the self uh i guess pr uh, stability of the board is driven by older people even as they die off they appoint themselves they appoint their friends they appoint contacts they appoint uh you know political uh, you know people and governors appoint people young people don't really run for governor it's always middle aged to older people who run for governor they appoint trustees at state hbcus when you when you talk about private HBCUs, who do I know? I know the funeral home director. I know the pastor of the largest church in the city. You know what I mean? I know the dude that owns six gas stations or three WalMarts. That's who's going to be on the board. That's not that's not going to be a young person. You're right. It's not going to be a young person. So uh, you know that I, I get it and I agree. But I'm just saying, how do you how do you infuse that? Uh, particularly because younger people, even when they're successful, aren't typically the ones that are making sizable donations to a governor and they but, aren't writing hundred thousand I mean, dollar checks to say make me a trustee i'm gonna buy my way in you don't like the governor has a campaign team his campaign team is like 30 and under right. we are the people on the ground we know right. what's happening we know how to connect we you're just a voice box you're just a representative of the people so right. maybe you need to bring one of your people that's used to being on the ground in that seat or well, at least had some experience on the ground because that's a lot of what happens. It's like you don't have your um your change makers in those seats. You have people that have just made a lot of money. Right. And making a lot of money isn't all about being smart all the time. Sometimes it's just, you're just lucky. And well, not just that, making a lot of money ain't the subject and the end in and the ending agreement of how to make a strong school. Even if you're donating a million dollars a year, that, that doesn't mean that you know anything about higher education. You could be given a million dollars a year and they could be blowing it right under your nose and you never right. know it. So it's a lot to unpack with that one. Let's move to the next topic. Um, I think this week, and there, there never was published a date or a time on this, but HBCU presidents were scheduled to or are scheduled to meet with the CEO of Google uh, to discuss racism uh, alleged by former Google employees, particularly on, on under the auspices of I was an HBCU, you know, kind of coordinator for developing talent and getting people from black houses into this pipeline. And y'all got rid of me. So you got the presidents of the five, you know, the big five HBCU engineering schools. So that's Prairie View, FAMU, a and Morgan. Um, I'm missing one. Howard. Oh. And and they were supposed to <laughs> and they were supposed to meet with the Google CEO. Mm hmm. My perspective on this is that you're, you're talking above the problem. The Google CEO and the HBCU presidents don't manage the hiring. Right. They don't manage the talent acquisition. Right. So what, what do you think? Do you guys agree with that? Or do you think that the executive influence can create a atmosphere for the hiring managers to do the right thing in terms of not only bringing in talent, but bringing talent along in the organization? First of all, to your point, Having people at the top discuss what has happened doesn't necessarily make sense unless they talk to the lower people who are responsible for the operations of the program. So that's one. Do we know? I don't know. I haven't seen anything to that effect. Number two, if they can't get it right, then maybe TMCF needs to manage that because they seem to know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what are they offering? The so 
That's one of their offerings. They seem to know how to do it. They just need to cut the check to TMCF and let TMCF place these these uh, STEM STEM educated HBCU people, uh, alumni, and people who are current students as interns. Let them handle this since you can't get it right. So let's Google put that to the Google, question. Google would never Google would never do that. For two, uh, hell, I'm, I'm gonna answer your question. Just there. The problem is that Google's a big ass company mm -hmm. and in big ass companies you have layers and layers and layers of management and leadership and staff who make decisions so it's important to speak to the ceo because the ceo sets the strategic vision of the company he also has the ability to make things happen a lot faster than middle management the third thing is that a company as google size would never allow tmc or anybody else to select people they're going to hire because, again, like they have what they're looking for in TMCF. TMCF may find a great student from FAM. They don't fit what we want in terms of culture. Because the one thing we're missing here is that... The whole are, thing is dying. So, 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 it is the so, waste of time. So, it's a waste of time. So, so, if that's what you're saying, this Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm about to put the rain alert on you. <laughs> so, don't do that. So the last thing is, right, there are great... HBCU alumni who graduate every year with engineering degrees, with finance degrees, with other STEM degrees, who don't fit Google's culture. Because at the end of the day, the culture of the organization is, is one in which we can say there are tons of people who are skilled, who have the skills, who don't get jobs in finance, who don't who aren't at work for Goldman Sachs because they just don't fit. And as someone who works in corporate America five days a week and has since I graduated, I can tell you people who have better grades than me who were smarter than me, who did not get the jobs that I got because they just didn't fit. And I'm not trying to get too deep into the cultural differences, but the issue with Google and HBCUs is that we have a pipeline of talented people. I don't know how well all of us fit into that culture, which is why in many cases, most organizations, we're tokenized. And we're tokenized because some of us don't have fit. And I, I, I'll, give, I'll give, one, give one prime example. I never forget my first day, I was working at Mary Corporate Headquarters, fresh out of school, first day you graduate in my position, but I don't say with pride, I say with disdain. But I was going to Morgan's homecoming, and my coworker looked over at me and said, you going to paint? And I said, paint? I'm like, I'm going to homecoming. He said, you going to paint? I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, you're going you know, to you paint your body? You're going to paint your body? I was like, nah. We don't do that. And 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 he was some he was someone in leadership. And culturally, people hire people who are like them. And they made people who are like them at our schools. And the consistent challenge will be the fact that we're asking to go and join majority white companies because companies because we don't have the capacity. And I just think that it's, it's going to consistently be a cultural issue because we can be as qualified as we want to be if we don't fit what they're looking for and we don't relate to them. We don't know the office jokes and office space jokes and watch Parks and Rec. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a consistent challenge. So if you can't do it, nor can the HCU presidents do it. This is the thing that started and, and amongst I, And I'll give you I'll give you even a better example. I had a, a president a, a conversation with a president about this. And this president told me a story about a previous stop where they served in leadership. And one of their strong programs was accounting. And they had a pipeline for students going into an accounting firm, a regional accounting firm. The students were stellar. They were top notch accounting accounting or, or accountants. The challenge was the students would get there for an internship or even for a job, knew the job inside and out. We're, we're among the best people there. They didn't know the software. And at some point, the, 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 the employer was saying, I can't do anything with you because we don't have time to teach you the software. Because at this other school, PWI, they're learning how to do this on the software that we're using. So even to Orz's point, not even just a cultural fit, sometimes it's just an infrastructure fit. And then you ask the question, if this comes up in a meeting with Google or Marriott or the Washington Post or whatever else, like you, you know, you're a great writer, you're a great reporter, but you don't, 
you don't have sources. Mm. You don't you don't have good relationships on Capitol Hill. You don't have good relationships with the Wizards. Like I need somebody that can do this today. I can't wait till you get ready. I can't wait till you learn the software. I can't wait till you learn the culture. We got to move today. Mm. So to the point that these leaders are talking about this thing, Eric, where 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 does this conversation legitimately go? Because we can see, the five of us can see that there's an infrastructure problem we got to deal with. There's a talent problem we got to deal with in terms of exposing these students, having them be top-notch and, re- and competitive with everybody else, including MIT and Stanford and India and China. We got, we got a talent thing we got to address. We got a culture thing we got to address. And we got an infrastructure, infrastructure thing we got to address. What, what good is the, is the leadership saying we got problems we got to address when we already know that? I'm going to tell you what I've learned in my various stops in higher education. When you start to involve decanal and executive leadership and trying to address issues at a company or an institution, and I'm making a point of saying institution because whether we like it or not, every single higher education president and or chancellor, including HBCU presidents and or chancellors, they do this as well. Mm -hmm. They will install a plan from a strategic campus-wide or business-wide or organizational-wide perspective and they will try to implement it from the top down. And change don't take place from top down. Mm -hmm. If you don't install a plan in which each department that may or may not have that issue but needs to improve upon that issue can fix itself, let's say it's a diversity and inclusion issue. Let's say it's a finance issue. Let's say it's any, any... you can name any issue that you want. Unless you figure out how to fix that on a departmental level from the grassroots up, you will not change the institutional culture. It doesn't work from top down. It just doesn't. Which is You can you talk about businesses. You could talk about the entire government. It is literally the same thing across the board. So my biggest issue is, is that you're going to have these HBCU presidents of these five institutions, and they mean well, and they're going to go talk to Google and try to figure out what's going on, and that's all well and great. But the question ultimately comes back to, uh, with those issues as it pertains to those students may or may not being able to get those positions and being unprepared on their individual campuses, are you implementing a strategic campus-wide perspective on trying to address it? Or are you attacking the issue from a grassroots level with the people that actually talk directly to the students and then building up from the Mm -hmm. bottom and improving them as they grow? Because if you really want to change your institutional structure to to, to make sure that people are, even if if it's an elevated level of code switching or fitting in or playing the game, however you want to call it, in order to spoke to it, you have to fix it on a very small level where the students are located or like you, Oh, it's an institution level. This is what we stand for as an institution. And it makes you as a president look good. It makes you as a chancellor look good because it's what you've implemented, but there's no real way for anybody to go in and assess that you created change on every single level that makes your students better. And so my biggest thing is, is that yes, we, Culturally speaking, like we have to understand, like work in their world, but live in yours, like figuring out the way to like make have that that real bounce. That's every right? day. Yeah. It's, it's every day. But the truth of it all is, is that we don't teach that enough at HBCUs. We do very much teach the be your authentic self and all of your authentic blackness. And that's a great thing. But Part of that is learning how to code switch because we, this is just what we do. Right. And a lot of it is that a lot of us need to learn a different way of code switching so that when we do get to that position and we take that veil off, then we open up the floodgates for those of us behind us. But we got to get there first. Now, the fortunate part is that you you are starting to see because of COVID, because of the murder of George Floyd, companies are starting to take the veil off and say, all right, we want to do better by black folks who work here. 
in a, in a whole bunch of industries and in a whole bunch of industries. But Katie, you're a STEM graduate. Mm -hmm. You know what it's like to feel in, in a graduate program or in a work setting like, oh, I've been doing this since, you know, I was undergrad at Coppin. And there may have been moments where you're like, damn, I've never seen this before. You know what so, I mean? Like, so, yeah, I mean, let me like, let me jump in because the young lady that we're referencing that kind of started this issue mm -hmm. um, about her treatment at Google had nothing to do with the idea of uh, curating talent within Google. She couldn't get people in the door. Like mm -hmm. she said, the HR was going out of their way to ensure the HBCU graduates did not get an opportunity. So we can't even talk about if we're talented enough. You don't know. Right. Literally, that's what I was about to say. And so maybe this time, if the CEO can take a look at it and say, damn, these notes really do throw this person out the window because it says Howard University instead of MIT. Because mm -hmm. that's literally what was happening. She would she would read the notes and then she would say, Hey, how did you come up with this conclusion? And then they would just shut her down. She um post, she had talked about it on Twitter, and I think she did mm -hmm. something else. Right. Um, kind of spoke to her experience there and why she had to eventually leave while they got rid of her because she was she was seen as combative because she was fighting the battle for us from within mm -hmm. and if you recall she was the if i recall this correctly she was the first hbcu graduate to get a job at google and they brought her in to bring in more hbcu graduates but it just wasn't happening because of that hr and whatever the logistics are about hiring people at google so they have a five billion dollar campus it's a plus 100 billion dollar business they could afford <laughs> you know what i mean they could afford to take some risk on students they're not going to lose any money over some hbcu graduates so it's, it's a it's a it, like tech in general is 75 percent white right now still in 2021 75 percent mm -hmm. white mostly men so them like trying to give up space so that we have opportunities is hard in itself you know what i mean so and that, as as dealing with that uh it conversations like this can be helpful but somebody has to take an active stance on yo maybe we do need to bring in more talent from other sectors and maybe two that's better is two points that i want to make one i don't want hbcus to unfair we, we talking about black colleges we're advocates for them but i don't want them to get the unfair burden of the only people who have a problem with this are HBCUs. There's a whole bunch of state schools. There's a whole bunch of, of mid-level, predominantly white schools sure. that had the same problem. The kids come out. If they're ready, they get blocked at the door. Or if they get let in, they're not ready. A whole bunch of schools have that problem. HBCUs just have the unfair burden because we're historically black. Mm -hmm. Number two, it, and I, I, I promise you, Tiffany, I don't mean any shade by this. How does this happen at Google when three years ago we were heralding Howard West? How did we say we got a partnership that's exclusive to Howard that other HBCUs will be able to backdoor their way in? I was thinking about where we're gonna where we're gonna have a specific microscope placed on graduates from HBCUs, and we're here talking about this. Isn't it like what you said about well a few years ago about how people? People will say that they did a thing to say that they did the thing. Mm -hmm. to, to that point, we're talking about a partnership that sets the tone for, for, for the direction that they say that they wanted to go in. But again, how what does that look like on an operational daily level? It looks like what sis exposed, which is why I said. If they can't do it, if they won't do it, they should not be responsible for it because they clearly can't do it. So if we we like Katie said in in, in opposition to ORS, we can't even discuss cultural fit if you don't have a body to judge what the experience has been there outside of what sis said. You can't. The the evidence is not there because they're not there. We are not there. I'm so like, they're, not gonna, they're, not, they're not they're not gonna invest in capacity though. This is what comes down to a company is that large. I've worked at I've worked at F one hundred company. Companies of that large can invest in capacity if they want to. They're not if they want to. to and, and to that point, should but we but, so, they're, but they're not. So oh, oh, right, right oh, now we're in the world of you know, we're, we're in the world right now we're in the world of COVID where companies are growing their share price by cutting costs and doing different things. All the all the D and I stuff sound good, but Again, it's important to consistently remind us ourselves and understand that even when we get these lanes, 
these lanes are not meant for the whole company. This lane might be meant for five people over five years. Like, but you know what? I wonder if it's to Katie's point that this is a specific symptom of this particular industry. For example, today we just found out that is it finance uh, too. What, but what I'm saying is, I wrote an article about this, right? And one of the industries where you don't see this, where you see active pipelines from HBCUs getting bigger and bigger by the year, is healthcare. Is healthcare because there's the Lewis Stokes. Uh, Health Sciences Alliance, right. they're sending out hundreds of graduates to medical school. And those graduates are leaving medical school at the top medical schools in the country from HBCUs. You got kids. People don't know Tougaloo is a major producer of black doctors. You wouldn't know it. They don't. We don't talk about it a lot. But that is a pipeline, G. And, and, and nobody has a problem finding a black doctor from the undergraduate level. Xavier, Tougaloo, Howard, Morgan. You, you looking for a black doctor? There's 10, 11, 12 HBCUs that can get you one today. Jackson State. There's 10, 11 of them that can get you one today. I know, I know these, I've interviewed them and they've had no problems. They've gotten to medical school. They've gone on to lucrative careers. Health, healthcare seems to have gotten it right. Education seems to have gotten it right. Journalism seems to have gotten it right. We just lost the brother from Jackson State, Sekou Smith, who was writing for TNT. We don't, we don't have a problem getting HBC graduates in some of these industries, but tech seems to be the one whipping our ass. So you know why, you know why specifically? Because they don't value education. Mm. They only value skill. Right. And so when you got an industry that is antagonistic towards colleges, literally, mm. by and large, antagonistic. Like if you talk to some of these dudes that were in it, been in the field for the past 20 years, I didn't go to college. I just learned how to do. Blah, 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 and now I'm in this position. It's mm -hmm. like, yo, I mean, I'm talking about chief of IT. Terrible at business management. Doesn't know a, a, a mouse from a keyboard but is in charge of the entire department from development to infrastructure to customer service. Like, and I mean, that is, that it is a symptom of the field I'm, that I can assure you. Of. That point to that point, then that means that, that we won't ever get there because we're not set up to be able to, to just pull that card and be like, Oh, I didn't go. And no, I, we can get, we can get there, can but, get the, there, but we're going to no. deal with some bullshit. For we, either we, that or we gotta create our own to be able to do and we don't have that privilege like in space we we don't have that right. so that's one but going back to 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 the point about um what or is saying that the hbc pre like it's just not going to happen google's not going to do it when people say stuff like that then what are we here for why are you wasting my time we shouldn't be talking if 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 this is for if this is for the photo op, we good at calling people out on photo ops. Why are we meeting? Well, then this means we need to play hardball well, because I can tell you, I can answer that. Why question. are we here? No, no, no. Let, me, let me jump in. I'll bet, so, I'll bet, I'll bet right here? now in two years, in two years, we'll have the same conversation about how they had this meeting and the problems that exist because, again, there is no incentive for these companies to hire us. We look good. We look good, but we have no impact on their bottom line. Google, Google, you know, Google gets more what? applications than any other company on earth beside behind Tesla. They don't need us. We want to be there. We fulfill a corporate public relations need for them, but we are not what they need in terms of, in terms of their P and L. We do not affect the business model. We don't. One because Google deals with it, they give most of most of the free anyway, and they just sell your data and then sell their businesses, which we don't have. I mean, it, it, to me, it's laughable. Even when the HBCU West, and I, I'm probably on record saying it was laughable at the time. But I find it funny because we have a much better chance, like Jared said, to get with more local and regional organizations, create better pipelines, and fulfill those jobs. Instead, we try to come at LVMH, who don't hire many people. We try to go at JP Morgan Chase and the Google and they ain't hiring us. Well, and, and let me let me actually jump into that because part of the blame rests on our own HBCUs utilizing these big name companies as a PR stunt to say, oh, look who we have access to, look who yeah. we have relationships that's with, that's even if they're not leading to no fruition. Because like, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, we got all these people that work in these places. There is not a care in the world on what their experience of working in these places even looks like. Mm. 
we don't we, we there's no follow up with our alum. Oh, you got a job with 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 JP Morgan? Great. We're gonna report that in the in the alumni newsletter and we're gonna send that out. We ain't gonna follow up with you to see if they actually treated you well. We ain't gonna follow up with you to see if you actually were able to advance going forward. Because at the end of the day, we all we only care about bragging about the fact that we were able to prepare our student to go to this big name Fortune 500 company to because we still care about our proximity to whiteness as an HBCU and who we actually can get employed. True. But let me add one. There is a point for us being there, though. Now, they may not need us, and it's debatable whether or not we need them. But in the tech space, a lot of these more successful startup companies have roots in a Google, oh. a Facebook, a Tesla. They have access to people that can invest in their small business. So there mm -hmm. is value in us creating that economic bridge from HBCU to Google and the other big tech companies. However, we also need to understand that we don't we don't need them to be great. But if we'll hit a there's a wall we'll hit, right? Because mm -hmm. then they could just take whatever we do, copy it, and then sell it for much cheaper. So it's, it's so many industries that seem to get it right. And and tech and computer and, science. And remember, tech, and this is another thing. This is why me and Jared had this conversation, and he doesn't understand my point. Tech <laughs> is also the other one that is ungoverned. Mm -hmm. Every other industry has some sort of governance from the federal from the federal level. Mm -hmm. Tech doesn't, so they have no rules to abide by. Wow, West, absolutely none. And this is why the federal government also needs to institute a Department of Technology for two reasons: one, for defense, because the next the next war is fought on the computer. Mm -hmm. And it's being fought on the computer, but other, but to regulate these jackasses because they, <laughs> they, are, they are lawless right now. They have entirely too much power because over politics, start, over commerce, over right. every Reddit it's just messed up. Reddit just shot GameStop stock up. Yeah, yo, I was Reddit. exactly. I was exactly. And the thought used to be that pilot that the in, in, stuff on the computer couldn't affect the real world. Right. That's gone. Listen, That's gone. I'm gonna tell you that straight up. The fourth Die Hard movie. Robin Hood. Yeah, oh, right. definitely. The fourth dot that live free and die hard when your man shut down the whole federal government was like, Oh, yeah, go ahead and have to see Robbie right now. We thought that was a joke. Everybody, <laughs> thought, it, everybody <laughs> thought it was a joke. It's real life out here, but no, That's like it. to your point, it's it's when you get to those bigger points where it's like, I, 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 my charge is to those HBCUs and some others, especially ones down in places like Huntsville, Alabama, which is turning into Silicon Valley South for Ooh. anybody who's paying attention. Really? <laughs> oh, bro, if you go, or it's probably no, do do some look into what they got going on down in Huntsville, Alabama, in the area of, of, of Alabama because, State. Because of because NASA. Alabama a and them. NASA exactly. Has a big, NASA, right. NASA Listen, big site because, in North Alabama. Because right. of the Wild Wild West, we got to stop. We need the federal government, right? Right. Do more. Listen, because it's the Wild Wild West, a lot of our schools have to stop looking at these companies that are already like established mm -hmm. and start empowering our students. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if you create a disruptive to, to the industry, you can do whatever you want to. You can. Like we don't. We don't empower our own students to actually go and do it their own. We and empower them. Maybe we need to start looking at Palo Alto. Great. We need to start looking at where the, the other places they're stationed. Like uh, Tesla's in Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. and we need to look at that campus more so than Palo Alto. And I think that you made a, a critical point before we get into the last topic, um, Eric. Uh, we are thinking more in terms of integration. We need to think more in terms of disruption. Like mm -hmm. change the change the model. Like you keep thinking, let's be a part of the model. Let's no, let's break that bitch and make a new one. So let's get into the the last topic of the evening. Um, this is Tiffany's favorite topic: sports. Um, there is a report. <laughs> There's a report. Is this in the schedule? Hold on. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. There's a report that the NBA, uh, in in uh, negotiation with the uh, Pro Basketball Players Association, uh, that is looking to have the this year's All Star Game, NBA All Star Game in Atlanta, with the possibility because of COVID, um, of having it in an HBCU gym. Good look or bad look? How is that going? Oh, okay. So I'm just confused. Have y'all been in I mean gyms? All right. <laughs> that, that's what I was going. Right. Okay, listen, listen, listen I'm going to say this. I'm going to say I've this. I've been in both. I'm going to say this, and it's not going to be fair. But it, 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 like the entire city of Atlanta can like come after me. I don't care. There is not any school, any HBCU in Atlanta 
or the state of Georgia that needs to be hosting anything <laughs> basketball wise. Point blank, period. Y'all are better off coming up to Winston Salem, going to game, going to games, and actually getting that energy. Right, like I'm so like, what school in Atlanta do you even think about? First of all, you before talking about before before basketball, because before. there is a, a vacant gym in a, in Atlanta. Um, Tiffany, stop it! Don't don't. Stop it. don't. That whole <laughs> campus is vacant. It's vacant, right. and according right to now, that whole, that whole campus say, is vacant. We got cleaned up. Nobody <laughs> in there, and Listen. it can oh, be wait. Used. Listen to that point. To that point all right. This might be an opportunity for an HBCU to get a new gym. No, no, so. no, hear me out. No, it's going like to sound you're, you're right. But hear, me out. College. Hear, me, hear me out. The Atlanta Hawks can't fill their own stadium when the world <laughs> open up to get people to watch basketball. You talk about going to Atlanta? You coming like, in Trey Young, bro? <laughs> they, can't, they can't get a sold out game to watch Trey Young. I'm not trying to hear them. So, I mean, so, here, so here's what appears to be the details behind this. And I can respect it because Chris Paul is one of the architects behind this idea. Sure. Okay. If, we're, if we're going to be playing in front of no fans anyway because of COVID, mm-hmm. if we're not going to have fans, why not give the promotion to an HBCU by saying, hey, 2021 NBA All-Star Game live from Morehouse or Clark Atlanta. They need to go to Durham. Go to Texas. <laughs> no, no, like, no, 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 the second thing that I would say is, is that we've seen this before, even with fans, when there was a lockout and it, yeah. uh, LeBron and Carmelo organ- and Chris Paul, again, organized the tour where they were playing at. Did they play at Winston? They played at Morgan. They definitely played at Winston. They played, they played at Winston. It was, one of, it's one of, it was one of the best pro-am games. They played at Clark, they played at Clark Atlanta, I believe, or Morehouse. Yeah. So they, they've had fans pack an HBCU gym. Well beyond capacity, I'm sure the fire marshal was worried, but I'm saying they've had a, an NBA style game at a smaller venue, particularly at an HBCU. But listen, because you're not going to have fans, you're not going to have crazy, you know, parking requests. You're not going to have so much of the infrastructure that you would typically need for for an All Star game, like fireworks and and heavy AV and all that stuff. You just need a place to play and they, where they can televise it. That stuff is in. How much will it cost to televise it though to an NBA little? Tel- so here's the problem, right? That's the NBA show. Why do we care? But, but, we don't but, care right, about that. For, for the money. But see, right, but, but see but here's the thing it. though. It's going to require a lot of advocacy from someone to say spend this extra fifty grand to run to make sure the sound works throughout the whole gym. Pay this extra money to make sure we have all the camera angles we need. Because no, no, no because, because honestly, this is different. This is why. This is why they play like national championship game for college basketball, usually in either NBA arenas they, or at larger right, stadiums. Well, stadium, right. it's, <laughs> it, it's because they those other angles that you can't get in smaller gyms. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm all for them doing this. I really don't care. I feel like Atlanta gets far too much credit for HBCU. Facts. Facts. And it happens in far <laughs> Facts. Like Atlanta. That is not the HBCU capital. Like, Atlanta, Atlanta, what do Atlanta do? No, no, I'm gonna go to I'm Nashville. A, can we go to Houston? Can we go to the, the Triad? Can we go right. somewhere I'm, else I'm gonna go on record. Going to Atlanta. I'm gonna go on record and say this, and this is gonna be rude, but it is what it is. And this Washington, D.C. and Atlanta are not places you should go to to highlight HBCU football, basketball, or bands. <laughs> at all none of those locations we're gonna get so much hate mail and i have the only email address listen you can include my you can include my twitter on this i do not care listen i'm it, it, let's be fair about it all right like people had drum drum line i had people messed up there is no band in Atlanta, on the level of Atlanta A and T from Drumline, and it has not been for twenty years. Are there you is... saying that? Okay. 22, 22 years, twenty-two, twenty-two years, twenty-two years. 
Like let's call let's let's stop lying, okay? This we keep is, thinking of these places because wow. it's a lot of black people and there's a lot of black power in those areas, and that's great. But when it comes to HBCUs, like like let's stop lying to people, yo. You do not go to these locations to see a great HBCU football game. Well, you can see HBCU that HBCU City is at... Houston. Facts. <laughs> where you can see, where because, you can see TV, that people. But people can. Well, you can see the point that people align HBCU culture with those things you just mentioned: black power in, in infrastructure yeah, but and infrastructure. Oh, oh, oh. And then the development of the city. That's why it's Atlanta. Is Charlotte? Is DC? Man, That's what it's Charlotte. 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 We ain't cool in Charlotte for nothing. Yeah, double A, bro. Listen, I'm gonna tell you straight <laughs> up. Where <laughs> HBCU graduates go does not necessarily is not a good model for what where HBCU culture is is actually performed and looked I at agree. in the best sentiment. I and agree. People have to stop doing that. Like, yeah, bl- bl- blame Howard. Blame Howard. It's not how it's fault. I'm not gonna blame how it's fault. You can't I mean, look. We, we've had, we've had this Howard conversation. Don't money into their band or their sports, but it's not their fault. <laughs> we've had this conversation That's before. It's more than a game, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the motto. It's more than a game. Hey, listen, we've had this we conversation. Are both correct. We are both what? correct. But the but the larger point is right. this: is that a, is that a good look? And Katie, to your point, or actually, or to your point, or, or I forgot who made the point, but the investment in having it at an HBCU gym and whatever the cost would be, that would be the cost of a commercial they would run for Black History Month. That would be the cost of a commercial, you know, some kind of campaign they would do to say we support, you know, Black Lives Matter or another stuff. So that investment in in outfitting the gym to accommodate the All-Star game, uh, okay, in kind, you know what I mean? Like that, and, and that'll go to support the HBCU, but I think that the belief is this will be such a marketing, a heavy marketing investment for the Black colleges. We saw this at the Super Bowl. Like you brought out all the HBCU Hall of Famers. Mm-hmm. Them brothers retired thirty years ago. Mm-hmm. Some um some of the best ones are dead, mm-hmm. right? But you still said we're going to invest in the market value of saying HBCU on a Super Bowl stage. I I look at it that way. And to that point, if you look at it as a marketing tool, and you look at it specifically for somebody like Chris Paul, who's trying to who for a year now on the low so uh, for for years past but in overdrive in the last couple years has been saying yo align hbcus with this brand mm-hmm. i'm a bully i'm gonna make sure that that these schools get free commercials while i'm playing they didn't pay you for jack and every time they show my shoes it's an hbcu commercial that was a, he Brody the, like ten or twelve schools hey, yo, in the he, marketing space. Just, you know what I mean? He just did a State Farm commercial where he was walking to support black colleges. Uh, <laughs> crew man. You see what I'm saying? Like most of the time, athletes get fined for that. I mean, he did not catch one fine for it because they knew what time it was. It was Black Lives Matter season. Well, you gonna, you gonna find Chris Paul from wearing HBCUs on his shoes? You don't want that smoke. No, not at this point. Not last summer. Probably for wearing pink shoes. Like yes, the NBA is that petty. I, I <laughs> no, know, it's, it's open now though. They changed the rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Everybody about, 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 about two years ago. Yeah. So, so I'm saying to that, if you look at it from that perspective as a market employee, is it a is it a good look, or would you expect more? It's a, a more it's substantive a, a synergy between the league and the school to say, okay, that looks good, but can we get a coaching uh, workforce development pipeline or can we get a sports management you know, pipeline? But it's a look. And that's just take it for what it is. Okay. It's a, it's a good look because black folks are easily impressed by representative politics. Is that rude? <laughs> I, what? Am I wrong? Okay, like, let, like we. Oh, I hear what you're saying, but we get no, no, like it's it's rude, but it's also not incorrect, right? Like, I literally had a cold conversation with a whole bunch of brothers like last week talking about. They was like, I wish I would have seen more blackness to celebrate Kamala's uh, first time as a as a vice president. I was just like, my dude, it ain't even her inauguration. You up here. You up here pressed about how many black people up here singing stuff and, and performing? Man, we got policies to worry about. You up here talking about, I wish it was more black singers. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. At some point, it's like, okay, good. Like, you want to do a reverse? Why not? I did you you want to you impress me? Build up. Like, in this, 
you put me on record saying this. You want to impress me? Y'all going to Atlanta? Build and it's like build up five different buildings on the campus of Morris Brown. Give it to the give it to the school, including the basketball gym, and then actually had the All Star game. Next. <laughs> <laughs> you would have impressed me. Do that, and I don't know. <laughs> we already I mean, did that. First of all, we already did that with the Olympics. The Olympics did just that. Yeah, in, in what, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to impress me, do that. And then create, as a matter of fact, and then after that, double down and create a whole program to create like a MBA, like an MBA or a business administration degree that focuses on working in the athletic field for people at Boris Brown so that then they can actually find pipelines into the NBA. Yeah, I'm give Kevin James like, an if idea. You, if you go and do it, and like really do it. Do it something that doesn't matter. Don't give me this like representative BS, man. I ain't got time. Tiffany, how do you feel about it? Do you, do you think it's just it's just for show, or do you think it, it, it's something that can lead to something with something? The All Star Game is just a showcase, man, and just leave it as a showcase. Yo, we are as HBCUs. We don't have time to just be a showcase. We got real issues to deal with. But I'm, well, I'm but more, the, I'm but not the, like, concern myself with the philanthropic efforts of the NBA. Let them do. That's just extra. That's icing on the cake. Like mm-hmm. we have other we ain't getting no cake. cake before we can get some icing. We ain't getting no cake. Tiffany, can the NBA give us some cake? They hear this a damn ready whip, dog. It's a ready whip <laughs> bottle. <they> <laughs> <this. Whip. laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in hearing her perspective. Hold on, let me put the camera just on her because she doesn't want to talk about sports. So I need you to talk about this. Do you <laughs> put the camera on her? <laughs> um, I'm going to say this, and this is slightly aligned with what Oris was saying about Google in that um, if they wanted to, then they could. In terms of what? Making more substantive partnerships? Oh, yes. And I'm Mm -hmm. saying this to somebody who has had many meetings with Detroit Pistons uh, vice presidents, Mm -hmm. former and current. Um, If they wanted to, then they would. That was a flex, Um, by the way. No, it, no, 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 it's not a fact. <laughs> it's the reality. If they wanted to make a substantive change and substantive difference, then they would. For instance, I don't know when this whole All Star, whatever, whatever is. Is it February? Yes, yeah. no, Okay, so great. February, the Pistons has a whole Black History Month slash equity um, platform. I'm interested to see what it looks like. I know what it's looked like in the past. Shade. Hey, man. If they <laughs> wanted to make a difference, then they would. We have so many teams in an HBCU state. If they wanted to make a difference, then they would. There are NBA players who can only do what they can do as individuals. That, that does not compare to the people that write their checks. If mm. they wanted to do it, then they would. I, think, I don't think they care too much to do it and do it right. Otherwise, it will be done. Let's if, take you look at the, if you look at the companies that these people made their money with to buy the NBA teams, that explains everything. I mean, mm-hmm. we, the, we talk about Stephen Ross and the money he owns at Miami Dolphins. He also has the University of Michigan Business School named after him. Um I mean, you look at a lot of these guys who own teams, like they're not, there's not going to be, the NBA is a player-driven league. People people support players. They go to watch the players, mainly mainly because it's less players on the on the floor and they don't, they don't leave. So the NBA careers are much, much longer than let's say the NFL or even baseball. But I think that the, the, the thing that the NBA players, in my opinion, should be doing is they really should be looking to develop better pipelines in general for college basketball, because as you as I've been as I said before, college basketball is a wasted system. They should just send the kids who are good to the G League. Everybody else can go and play primarily, get their degrees, and if they're good enough, then maybe go to the draft after three or four years. But I think that I think that what NBA players should be doing to help HBCUs is putting in a barrier to entry because the only sport that the only two sports that actually send players consistently to drafts and make money from smaller schools are baseball and hockey because they have a three-year minimum. Mm-hmm. And when you play baseball, you have to play college baseball for three years before you get to the draft. Either go to high school or three years. So kids come mm-hmm. from 
um, states in, in Florida in the middle of nowhere. Kids come from um, these random D2 schools in California and Arizona because there's no, there's no, there's, there's a barrier to entry. Like you have to play three years if you go to college unless you get drafted out of high school. And I think that type of model will benefit HBCUs because then it would force many of the top talent to go to a school and have to stay for longer because mm-hmm. everyone can go to Kentucky and Kansas and Duke because they don't stay in one year. And so there's never a, there's never too much talent there at one time. So if they want to really create equity and it's not a good topic at all, but if they want to create equity, then you would, you would push to have a system where either where the, the top kid, right. well, well, where the top kid is like LeBron don't waste a spot in college, mm-hmm. but then also the kids that do go to college, have three years, so a top kid who's a freshman and sophomore, you're not going to go to that school. He's still going to be there another two years, possibly. You, you would look at a school like Morgan or Fam or a different way, and it would create more equity within college basketball for our school. And it, because basketball and baseball are both sports that don't have a qualifier in terms of FBS or FCS like football, we can really make more money off of it. But again, no one wants to talk about how NBA policy affects what happens in college athletics. So the NBA said, we're going to make y'all wait three years like baseball does. I guarantee you we'd have more teams from HBCUs and the MEAC and the SLAC and the, the schools that chose to go to white conferences. We'll speak about them. But I mean, the schools sorry. and the MEAC and the SLAC would have, would have a better they – would, they would have a better chance of making the tournament, being a higher seed, hosting games. It would create a whole new ecosystem of money. But then the NBA players don't care about that. They want the symbolism. So. Are well, we going to OT? Because I'm over this. <laughs> First of all, we're like 20 minutes over time anyway. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a shower. Because we, we oh. were we ran it on. <laughs> But again, thank you, family. I appreciate y'all. This was a wonderful yeah, conversation yeah. On, a, on a wide range of stuff. This is a, this is a way to come back in the new year um, with some with some heavy topics. I appreciate y'all with the insight and the intelligence. Um, Sirius XM 142 HBC Radio. This has been Digest at the Dark. Check us out, HBCU Digest. You can follow me at Jared Carter Sr. on all social media. And thank you for putting up with me sounding like Mike Tyson on the mic. We will see you again uh, next time. Peace. (laughs)